Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry, we're starting just a few minutes after 11. Um, my computer had a little bit of technical difficulties, but we are getting started with this. Um, this is just a basic info about guardianships and conservatorships, and I think most people um, just have questions about it. I know we have seen a lot in the news lately with the whole Britney Spears um, fiasco and her conservatorship, and while I can't speak to California law, I don't know what the legal sides of it there, but it's definitely brought it to people's attention. When is a guardianship needed? When is a conservatorship needed? And understanding what these really are. So that's what we're trying to um, go over today in this webinar. A little about me to start. Um, my name is Lauren Ward and I'm an attorney with a business law firm in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I mean, I'm licensed only here in the state of South Carolina. I'm a graduate of the University of South Carolina, and I'm a graduate of the University of South Carolina School of Law. And my main practice areas are the state planning, like the with elder law, special needs, all these type guardianships, conservatorships, Medicaid planning, and business planning. So those are my main practice areas. Um, but let's jump on in and learn a little bit more about guardianships and conservatorships. So our questions for outlines for today is what is a guardianship? What is a conservatorship? When is it needed? What is the process? And everybody wants to know how can I avoid this since it is a costly and long process to go through. So guardianships and conservatorships are all administered by the probate court here in South Carolina. Um, these We're talking about guardianships for adults, for incapacitated adults in this situation. We're not talking about guardianships for minor children that's going through the family court. That's a completely different issue, and I do not practice in family law, so I cannot tell you too much about that. But what we're talking about today is guardianships and conservatorships for incapacitated adults. So this is a protective proceeding administered by the probate court to protect a vulnerable adult. This is not for children in the guardianship situation. That would handle in family court. We do have conservatorships for minors if they inherit money in the probate court, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're really just focusing on the vulnerable adult today, so someone over the age of 18. So a lot of the proceedings for this are the same, but a guardianship is used for the medical well-being and day-to-day -day needs of the individual, while a conservatorship is about the financial needs. So there are two different offices that are two different fiduciary positions held for this incapacitated person. So guardian is for that day-to-day, -day, everyday situation where conservatorship is more for the financial situation. And they can be two different. So sometimes we'll go more into this too. Sometimes you need a guardian and a conservator. Sometimes you need one or the other. And sometimes it's two different people that serve as a guardian and a conservator. So we'll go through that as we go, but really we're looking at protecting that vulnerable adult with either guardianship for their day-to-day -day medical well-being or conservatorship for their financial being. So let's talk about when do you need these proceedings? So it has to be an incapacitated adult. So some common examples are if it's a minor who is turning 18 that is incapacitated. So um, it's a minor with a disability, for instance, they have um, Down syndrome and are unable to function on their own. Um, they might have some brain defects, had a tra traumatic brain injury as a child, had strokes, um, any of those type situations had where they can't really handle, they don't have the functioning of an adult, um, any different disability like that, but it's a minor who's turning 18 because at this point, the parents, they're 18, they're a legal adult, so without this guardianship, the parents can't act for them anymore. The other we have is um, maybe an elderly person who has now lost capacity. They may have dementia and Alzheimer's, can no longer care for themselves. Those are usually the situations we have a guardianship. We're looking, or there are times during a person's life where they will need this. Um, so maybe their person's in a car wreck and had a, or had a stroke and they're not elderly, they don't have dementia, but they have this traumatic brain injury 
or something happened to them which requires them to need this guardianship or conservatorship. So it is an incapacitated adult. Um, the guardianship we need when the person cannot manage their day-to-day -day affairs and their medical well-being. And then we have the conservatorship, which we talked about was the financial well-beings. You can need a guardian and a conservator at the same time, or some situations may require one or the other. So a lot of times when a minor is turning 18, um, they may not have any financial assets, so they may not need the conservatorship. And there are times maybe the person can handle their medical and daily well-being, but they need a conservator to handle the finances because they just can't handle that side of it. So a lot of times they do go together. If you're elderly and you have dementia and you have assets in your name, you need that conservatorship, but you also need the guardianship. So it's judged by a case-by-case -case basis on what that individual person needs. Um, are they needing, do they have financial assets? If they don't, the conservatorship probably isn't needed. If they do have financial assets and they need a guardian, they're probably going to need that conservator appointed too. So it's just understanding the different positions. So pretty much this, to bring a guardianship or conservatorship action, this is a full court proceeding. This is not um, something simple or to take lightly. Um, if you are thinking you need to bring this for someone, it is, I know, has been a hard decision on you. It is something that um, nobody does lightly or takes lightly because this is a serious situation where you're taking away legal rights of a person. You are saying this person no longer can act for themselves and they are taking away their legal rights. So come when you come to this decision that this is what the person needs and you think it's the best interest for them, I know it has not been a lightly made decision. But the person who wants to bring the action is known as the petitioner. So this is the person who is bringing the action to typically be appointed guardian or conservator in most cases is the petitioner. And then the respondent is the incapacitated person. So in probate court, um, we use petitioner and respondent. It's not as adversarial as um, plaintiff and defendant that you see in like civil court cases. So the person that brings this action is the petitioner. And they're typically the person wanting to be guardian and conservator. Um, I think it's a good time before you bring this action to meet with an attorney and talk about, do we need a guardian and a conservator? Do we need both? And kind of go over the whole picture of the situation. But when you decide it's time, you would have to fill out a petition with the probate court. And it's online, I'm scourts.org, look at the probate forms. Um, the probate court has very specific forms for this. And with this petition, you would go through and have to lay out why this person needs a guardian or conservator. So you're going to need to talk about what condition they're diagnosed with. So it's Alzheimer's or it has um, some other medical disability. You're going to need to discuss that. And you're going to need to say how that impacts their life. So they can't do A, B, and C because of this disability. So a lot of times we want to see things like they don't know how to care for themselves in preparing meals. They don't know when to take their medicine. Maybe they don't know how to, they can't bathe themselves anymore. Um, they're unable to use the restroom by themselves. They need kind of constant care. And we're looking at a guardianship situation and we're looking at conservator. Um, it could be a little bit different that they don't understand finances while they can care for themselves. They don't understand finances. They don't understand money. They don't understand the value of it and what all this means. Um, so it's looking and you're having to tell the court why this person is incapacitated. And you also have to tell the court what legal rights you want taken away, which tend to be in most situations, all legal rights taken away. So things like the right to buy a house, the right to enter contracts, banking transactions, the right to marry, um, all those different things, the right to vote. You're asking the court to take this away so this person is incapacitated and they shouldn't be able to do anything. So that's going through there and listing all these different 
things they should not be allowed to do anymore. And there's a list that the statute gives us on what we base on what legal rights we take away. And that'd be something you go through with your attorney and answer, but that's pretty much what you're putting in the petition. You want to talk about their diagnosis, how they handle their day-to-day -day life, and then what rights you believe need to be taken away. And the court's also going to want to know, is there a better way to do this? Do they really need this guardianship or conservatorship. And a lot of times when you're coming in this situation, there's no other option but this at this point. But also when you do this, you have to have a sled check done on the petitioner who wants to be guardian or conservator. And this is so the courts can make sure that there's nothing in the background that would hurt this person, making sure that the petitioner is fit to be this. Um, if you're looking at a conservatorship, you're also going to have to have a credit report done, a credit check, because the court's not going to want to appoint somebody who can't handle their finances to handle someone else's finances. And with this, you also need a doctor's affidavit, which is known as the examiner's report. And this can be the person, the respondent, the alleged incapacitated individual. Um, you would it would be could be their treating physician um, that fills this out and pretty much says they have the same thoughts you do that this person is unable to take care of themselves and this is very important because as an attorney I don't know if someone's incapacitated or not that's a medical determination and a court determination so the doctor needs to give their testimony so the judge can make the best decision possible so we need that examiner's report from the doctor to tell us what the doctor's beliefs are in his or her medical opinion. So once we submit this packet to the court, it has to be served on the alleged incapacitated individual and it has to be served on them personally. So if you're hiring a process server to do this, they need to hand it to them directly. They also get noticed they have a right to counsel. So the courts wanna make sure we protect this incapacitated person. So they have a right to counsel. So after 15 days of being served with a petition, they either find their own attorney or the court will appoint one for them. So um, if they don't have their attorney, sometimes the court appoints it or sometimes the attorney you're working with helps um, figure out an attorney that can handle this for you. But we do oh, have we do have to make sure they get served with this notice of right to counsel. Um, and then after that, counsel would be appointed. And in this situation, they usually have to have a guardian ad litem as well. Um, sometimes if the person is so very incapacitated, they can't communicate, the attorney will ask to be relieved as attorney and serve just as a guardian ad litem. This happens in cases a lot of times where a person is unable to communicate at all and there's no real attorney-client relationship because they can't communicate. So once all this is done and the attorney is going to, if they're still an attorney, they're going to be there and the guardian ad litem does a report. The attorney has to meet with the, the respondent's attorney meets with them and decides if they can serve as attorney or if they need to be guardian ad litem. And then after that, the guardian ad litem has their report as well, where they go through and say, or is the petitioner fit to be the guardian ad litem? What, does this person really need it? And the court does weigh heavily on this guardian ad litem's opinion because they are doing what's in the best interest of the incapacitated person. They're not on the side of the petitioner, not on the side of the respondent. They are trying to do what is best for this incapacitated person. So once we've done all of this, there's going to be an actual hearing with the judge on the merits of the case. A lot of it comes down to the testimony of the petitioner, the testimony using the doctor's um, statements as evidence of this. And sometimes the incapacitated, per the alleged incapacitated person will be examined as well if it's contested. A lot of times it's not contested at this point. Everyone's in agreement this is needed. Um, but that's the pretty much the overall process, but it is a court hearing. You have that formal petition and summons. It has to be served, and then they're appointed counsel, and then there's a guardian ad litem to do the best interest for the incapacitated person, and you have a hearing. So it is a very formal procedure. 
a lot of times people want to see how can I avoid having this? Because I will say the gar the conservatorship guardianship process is expensive. Um, you know, it's a true court case. It's going to have a lot of attorney's hours involved. And especially if it gets contested and you have to bring in experts and everything like that, it, it's, it is not a fun process for anybody. Um, no one wants to be told they're incapacitated and have their legal rights taken away. That's not a fun process. Um, and it's hard on the petitioner as well because they're probably having to do this for mom or dad. And they're not wanting to handle this situation like this, but you have to do what's in the best interest of this person, which sometimes is, is guardianship conservatorship if they truly are incapacitated. But there are some ways we can avoid doing this earlier on. Um, so while the person has mental capacity, making sure they have a durable power of attorney that allows somebody to handle their finances for them, that could get rid of the need of a conservator a lot of times. Having that health care power of attorney to handle medical decisions for you, that can relieve that need of a guardianship a lot of times. So making sure that you have these powers of attorney in place before anything happens and you become incapacitated. These are a lot cheaper to set up a lot easier to deal with than having to go through these formal court proceedings. Now, in some situations, they're not going to be avoided because if you have an incapacitated minor who becomes an adult, they are never going to have capacity to handle doing these documents. But for adults who at the time have mental capacity, this is a great way to get these documents in place to hopefully help you avoid that guardianship and conservatorship proceeding. Um, I recommend everybody, whether you're 18 or 100, having both of these documents because none of us know what tomorrow would hold. So having both of these things in place allows you to hopefully avoid that conservatorship um, situation or guardianship situation. So here's kind of my final thoughts, just summarizing everything. You need to know when the process is needed. When do you need to bring these legal proceedings? When the person is incapacitated? and unable to make decisions for themselves, that's when you're gonna wanna bring it. If they have mental, if they're just making dumb decisions most of the time, they're, that's just dumb decisions. They don't need to have a guardian and conservator. It has to be where they're mentally incapacitated. Um, and that has to be, and a doctor is gonna have to give you that examiner's report that states that they are mentally incapacitated and unable to handle their own finances. It's typically not somebody just making bad decisions. Um, you do have situations where addicts and things like that are involved, um, where there's drugs and possibly alcohol involved, and there could be situations there where the person is incapacitated and needs these protective proceedings. But just making a bad decision or just doing dumb things does not mean you're incapacitated, and you have to realize that this is a true legal proceeding where I'm trying, if I'm the petitioner, I'm trying to take away legal rights of somebody, or if I'm the respondent, I'm saying that I'm incapacitated. So you want to make sure that you looked at every possibility before that, like having those powers of attorney in place. Um, but there are times people have not done a power of attorney, they have no health care, no financial power of attorney, and they are truly incapacitated, that we do need these proceedings. So that way, somebody can step in and act for this person. So they're well taken care of, their finances are taken care of, their medical needs are taken care of, and they're not neglected just because they don't have these documents. So it's a good thing we have these proceedings to allow for people who don't have the powers of attorney to be able to have somebody step in and take control of their finances or medical well-being for their benefit, to be able to talk to their doctors and those type things. This was just a quick overview of guardianships and conservatorships here in South Carolina. We'll have a later webinar that may go a little bit more in detail for everybody, but I just, with all the news and everything with Brittany Sears, I've been getting a lot of questions about guardianships and conservatorships and just wanted to provide some basic info for everyone. Now, I can't, I don't know what's happening in California law, so I can't tell you about that side of things, but it is important for us all to know about these legal proceedings, especially if we have aging parents or we have children with disabilities to know when we need to bring these proceedings. Does anyone have any questions? Well, as always, feel free to send me an email or give me a call if you have any questions or have anyone that has questions about these proceedings. 
Um, once again, I'm Lauren Ward, and I'm an attorney with A Business Law Firm in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and I'm happy to answer questions about these type proceedings or um, talk to people regarding this. So please feel free to pass all my information or reach out to me. It has been a pleasure to have you all here today. And we'll have another webinar coming up in October. I hope you can join me for. And um, I hope you all have a great rest of your week, great weekend. And if you need any questions or concerns about this, please feel free to send me an email or give me a call. And I hope you all have a great day.